Good morning, everyone. My name is Barbara Bellissimo. I'm a capital campaign consultant at the Island Grown Initiative, and I am thrilled to welcome you all to the very first IGA Unveiled. Our topic of conversation this morning is the impact of food security on our island community. Our executive director, Rebecca Haig, and senior director of programs, Noli Taylor, have some really terrific information, some of which would be surprising. I believe to, to you about the impact of food insecurity here on the island and what Island Grown is doing about it and what our plans for the future are. We'll have time for some Q&A and conversation at the end of the session and we promise to have you done in an hour. We appreciate your spending some time with us this morning. Just a couple of housekeeping things before we get things rolling here. Um, we would like it if you could save your questions until after the presentations are completed. And if you have a question, please either use the Zoom raise hand feature or raise your physical hand. We've got um, my some of my colleagues here on the line who's, who are checking the Zoom boxes to make sure we catch everybody. And then can keep yourselves muted, please, until the open discussion at the end. The session, as you can see, is being recorded, and we will share that with you when it's compiled at the end, probably tomorrow or the next day. Um, with that, let's go ahead and get started. I'd like to introduce you all to Rebecca Haig, who's the Executive Director of Island Grown Initiative. Rebecca, take it away. Thanks, and, and thanks so much for all of you being on the call. I recognize many faces and names on the list. Um, many of you are engaged in some of this work, um, and we really do want this to be interactive. We want to lay out some ideas and some facts and figures today, but we want to hear from you as well and your perspective and through your questions, you know, raise issues that, that you think we as a community um, need to discuss. In, in many ways, you know, um, food insecurity, you know, for many is a day-by-day -day reality on Martha's Vineyard. As shocking as it is to many people, um, this island is a really difficult place for many families. And many working families struggle with making ends meet. So what, what does food insecurity mean? I mean, it can really range from families who are having to make decisions about sort of the quality of the food that they're serving their families and sort of making sacrifices of nutritional food in place of food that might just be cheap and filling for their families. No one wants to send their child uh, to bed with an empty stomach, but choices about what, how nutritious and how healthy that food is can be very difficult for families. It can also mean to the extreme that eating patterns for family members are disrupted, that people are skipping meals, that they're not eating, and that they're making really difficult decisions. Do I buy my medication or do I buy more food? Do I fill my car with gas to get my job or do I buy more food? And these are the kinds of decisions that have real consequences. I mean, think about it even in your own families for children. Um, the Pediatric Association has really looked at the issue of food insecurity. And they've noted things which really are obvious to all of us, but they have studied and they have documented that children who do not get regular nutritious meals have a reduced growth pattern. Um, their, their educational achievement is, is, is lower. They have behavioral issues and they often have long-term health consequences. And we see that in the rise in obesity um, in, in our community and in, in our society generally. Again, it gets back to the issue of you fill your kids up. And if that means with cheap carbos, you do that. And unfortunately, that's leading to a, a real epidemic in childhood obesity, which long term leads to diabetes and all kinds of heart issues. For elders, you also see a significant impact. You see a decline in all of their health indicators. You see a lack of mobility because they, they don't have the strength they need because they're not eating nutritious food. And you see depression. And you see people who don't have access to food at that age really begin to deteriorate quickly. So what are, what are sort of the numbers? So that, that gives you sort of the perspective of what food insecurity is. 
but it's driven by a lot of factors on island. I mean, Dukes County is the second lowest per capita county in the state of Massachusetts. Um, it's a seasonal economy. Um, we, we have lower wage jobs. We rely on immigrant population moving to the island to take care of all, all of us. And wages hover somewhere between 25 and 27% below the statewide median, while rents are 30% above the statewide median. As of the latest count, there are over 700 year-round residents of the island and families who are looking for affordable rental units, and that includes 210 kids. And we all face the same issues that these folks face, inflation, rising cost of gas, rising cost of food, and, the, and, and again, the, the incredible rise in rents on Martha's Vineyard. I, at IGI, our, our mission is to build a regenerative and equitable food system on the island, a food system where everyone can participate, where everyone can get good, nutritious food for their families. We grow food at our 40-acre farm. M many of you may know it as the Old Thimble Farm. We educate, we educate children in all the schools on the island how to grow food, the history of food, how to eat food, how to prepare their own food. We distribute food through our pantry at uh, the PA Club in Oak Bluffs. We prepare food through prepared meals. We're gonna do about 60,000 of those prepared meals. We have a year round kitchen at the airport and our chef, Jess Miller is on this call. She's uh, already cranking out a great number of good meals using local healthy products. And we process materials. We glean, uh, lean crops from our farm and other farms, and, and we process those and freeze those so they can be used in soups and stews and at the high school and in Jess's kitchen. So what, what are the range of, of our uh, offerings? And when, when I'm talking about IGI, I'm also gonna add a lot of the work that's done in the community when I, when I get through this list of the kinds of things that we're working on. Um, so if many of you have, many of you, some of you, I think on this call are actually volunteers at the pantry. I've seen many of you there. It's a place that people can come and shop for good nutritious food. We've really made a huge effort in the last year to increase the, increase the nutritional value of the food we offer. We have lots more fruits, vegetables from our own farm, other farms on the island. Local fishermen donate fish. We have a deer donation program so we can offer venison. We offer soil-based products to those who um, can't do dairy. So we've really tried to, to, to broaden the, the food we give so that it's not just to fill people up, but it's to keep them healthy and well. Uh, we right now have 4,200 registered clients at our pantry. Imagine, we probably have a year-round population of somewhere between 24 and 25,000. The latest census said 21,000 people, but many of us think that undercounts a lot of uh, the immigrant population that's here. That, that 4,200 represents 18 to 20% of the year-round population are dependent on some support for food. In 2009, we had about 742 unique individuals who were visiting the pantry on a monthly basis. As of now, we have 1,900 people who visit every who visit on a monthly basis. 1,900 is two and a half times what pre-COVID numbers were, and so it's not just a problem that was related in, entirely to COVID. Although the effects of COVID, the impact it's had on family savings and income, was significant. What we're seeing is the other issues that we've talked about are simply exasperating the issue, and we have not seen at all a decline. In fact, we just last month, we had 69 new registered families join the pantry. So this is not something that's going to go away. So you, you may ask, like, so who are these people from a demographic sort of point of view? So 32% of these people are between zero and 30% of the medium family income on the vineyard. The medium family income, and let's just use the example of a family of four. The medium family income is $105,000. So if you're 30% of that, and you have a family of four, you're reporting income of $33,000. Imagine living on that on Martha's Vineyard. 42% report a median income of 30 to 50%. At 50%, that family of four is earning around $55,000, trying to feed their family 
pay rent and work on Martha's Vineyard. And at 80%, you're getting closer to $85,000 for a family of four. And, and in terms of locations, these are mostly down island towns. 33% of our clients are from OB, 35% from Vineyard Haven, 23% from Egertown. Only 8% of all of the pantry folks who participate in the pantry either come shopping or have food delivered are from the three up island towns. And then finally, from a uh, 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 racial point of view, about 19% of all the folks are white, 12% are black, and 64% report as other. And we think that's a significant part of the Brazilian population on Martha's Vineyard. Um, some of you, again, as you think about this, if you have thoughts about our population we're serving, you might have some of the same kinds of questions we have, which is, who are we not reaching? Is it simply the, uh, the up island towns don't have a need or are we not developing a system that's reaching the folks in need in the up island towns? Are we serving the Brazilian population in every way that we can? These are the questions we ask ourselves every day. And again, when we open this up, we'd love to hear some of your thoughts about that. We've changed our programs significantly to make them more available. We experiment with that all the time. And again, any ideas you have would be terrific. Um, in terms of the prepared meals program, I think I mentioned this before, uh, we secured a year round commercial kitchen. Over the winter, we bought Kitchen Porch, which was a catering company on Martha's Vineyard. And as a result of that, we have a year round uh, kitchen facility at the airport. That facility allows just to make uh, good, healthy meals on a regular basis with the help of a whole team of volunteers. Um, in addition to that, we do a summer lunch program, uh, our community lunch program. We just got through this school vacation week. We actually offered uh, free lunches to folks who are visiting the airport, uh, the, uh, the uh, lunch and uh, the libraries on the island. We know that a lot of the families use the library almost as a daycare during school vacation week. And so we were at those libraries with lunches for kids who were sort of hanging out there. Um, we do about 12,000 to 15,000 summer lunches as part of our prepared meals program. And we're in the process of planning all that now. And again, a lot of volunteers who help us with that. We have a mobile farmer's market that goes out to lower income areas of the island. Some people don't just need free food, but they need less expensive food. And so we target neighborhoods where we know folks who are on the SNAP program uh, live in those areas. We accept SNAP. And um, some of you may know there's something called the Healthy Incentive Program. So that if you, have, if you pay for fresh veg vegetables at a farm stand, and this is also just to acknowledge there are some farm stands here. Morning Glory Farm accepts SNAPs programs. If you use that card to buy vegetables at a farm stand or farm, you get credited back on your SNAP card for the money that you spent. So it's in some ways, it's like free vegetables. So we really want to make this program accessible to folks. So for the people in some of these neighborhoods who can't get to the West Hillsbury Farmers Market or can't get to Morning Glory Farm, we definitely uh, want to bring the food to them and allow them to uh, access that at a much cheaper rate. We also do a gleaning program. Many of you, again, might be volunteers for this program. It's an unbelievable program. It's been in existence for almost 15 years. We have some core gleaners who have now graduated to be gleaning captains who oversee these gleans. We go into a morning glory farm on a regular basis. I see that Meg Athern is here, the athletes have been incredibly generous to us. You know, the concept of gleaning is that you allow folks to come into your field once you've taken your crop and take whatever is left. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm pretty sure, and I think Meg would confirm this, that, that Morning Glory goes the next step. They actually plant rows of vegetables for us and, um, and, and make more so that they can share that bounty with the community. So, so Meg, we're really grateful to you and your family for all the great work you do. And Meg personally has made sure that um, their farm stand is accessible to, to SNAP benefits. Like I said, it, it takes a community, it takes a village to address food insecurity. And, and we're not the only ones working on this issue. Um, we have many other partners from the councils on aging um, to the folks at the tribe, 
to um, community services, to the Y, to the Boys and Girls Club, to the English language learning camps, all of us are engaged. The, the community suffers at the churches in trying to make sure that we're getting good, healthy food to folks. So I want to just stop because I've thrown a lot of information at you. We, we didn't want to use slides because then I can't see all of your faces and it can't be so interactive, but we cer certainly have slides that, that can back up some of what we've talked about. But we thought it was important, um, and I asked Noli to be on the call. She's our Senior Director of Programs. She oversees all of our food equity programs along with Merrick Carrero and a, and a great team of folks. And you know, the statistics are one thing, but the stories, the faces of who are the people that we're serving um, makes it real to many people. So Noli, I'm gonna hand off to you and, and have you describe a little bit the kinds of folks that take advantage of our programs and what their stories are. Great, thank you. Hi everyone. Thank you for being with us today. Um, yeah, so there are thousands of people who get food from the pantry every year and each person has their own story about why they need support with food. Um, so I'll just highlight a few of them. For those of you who volunteer at the pantry, you see these people and hear their stories, um, but just a few stories to give you a sense of some of the folks that we're seeing. Um, one of our seniors worked as a professional her entire life. Um, and now as an elder, she's on a fixed income with social security and it just isn't enough to make ends meet. So she comes in as a shopper once a week and she comes in another day a week as a volunteer to give back. But this is someone who, you know, who worked her whole career and as an elder with a fixed income, it's just really hard to make it work on the island. Um, another woman came into the pantry with her five children with her. Her husband had just gotten a job at the Coast Guard and they were trying to get their feet under them. And it just, it was harder than they'd anticipated to find housing, to find childcare, and they needed support. And we were there with food uh, for them and their, for their kids. Um, another man was referred to us by the Visiting Nurses Association. He had just been through a medical procedure that meant he was homebound. Um, he lived alone, he couldn't cook for himself, and for his healing, he really needed access to good nutritious food. And we're now delivering some of our prepared meals to him every week so that he has access to good quality food to help him get better. Um, in November, a man came to us who'd been laid off from his job in a restaurant. And that's something we see a lot at the end of the season, that people who are employed by hotels, by landscapers, um, in retail shops, work ends at the end of the season. And then it's really hard to make it through the winter. And around this time of year, um, a lot of those workers start going back to work. We don't see them through the summer. And then when winter comes, we start seeing them again. Um, and that's the way of life in a seasonal community like ours. Um, another family came to us who just had arrived from Brazil. They had used all their savings to get to the vineyard. And um, you know they were here to find work, to find their dream jobs and to make a better life for their kids but it was early in the season, jobs hadn't started yet, housing is so expensive, there was nothing left over in the bank and they were able to turn to us for support with food. Um, any of us can run into episodic need. If there's a health crisis, if there's a death in the family, the loss of a job, um, most working people on the vineyard live on a financial edge. Um, so in addition to people who have episodic need, we also serve a core group of people who just can't make ends meet. That's elders on fixed incomes. That's working families whose income isn't enough to cover the high cost of food and rent and child care. Um, and that's the way that a lot of people on this island are living. It's paycheck to paycheck. The social security check comes in and it's gone before the end of the month. Payroll comes in and it's gone before the next paycheck arrives. And our staff and volunteers at the pantry are there to welcome people who need some help with warmth and dignity and a sense that this could be any of us. And we're just so glad that this is one need we're able to help fill for so many of the people who struggle on our island. Um, food is something we can provide. Um, and we're we're so glad to be able to do that.
Nelly, thanks so much. Um, so I just want to wrap up by talking a little bit of, so, so what's the next steps? Um, what does the system need to, to look like so that we can ensure that we're, we're, we're reaching everyone? And, you know, how can, how can we engage the community in improving um, access for food? As Noli said, you know, by the grace of God, it really could be any of us. It could be the construction worker who gets injured and can't work for three or four months. Um, the families that come, the individuals that come to us, um, many of you probably would imagine, you know, as much as we try to reduce the stigma, it's not an easy step to walk into the door of a food pantry. And um, people have images of their own mind about um, themselves and, and whether they should seek help from the community. So we're trying to do as much as we can to reach out to various communities on the island, to individuals, to make everyone realize that this is a community resource, that it's meant to support our community, that there's nothing about a stigma at all that's related to it. And, and so that's that's one of the challenges, I think, as a community and the way we can, you know, we can always use your help, which is to encourage people to to take advantage of these this is this is for them this is to make our community a better community so the way things work now as as you probably gleaned no pun intended from the conversation um you know there are there's a variety of sources of food um that is available from the gleaning at the farms to the donations some of you probably put donations into those uh, purple baskets um, at the different grocery stores. We go once a week, every week to the Boston Food Bank. We're members of the Boston Food Bank and we pick up somewhere around eight to 9,000 pounds of food there. Um, there's, there's just people are donating things from their garden. You know, the hunters are giving us product. There's a lot of different places that food's coming in. And there are also a lot of different providers. We are not the only people. Again, I mentioned before, it's the, it's the community suppers at the churches. It's the Councils on Aging. It's the Meals on Wheels program. Um, it's just Jen Randolph who's starting a new program for uh, women who have faced uh, difficulty in their families up in Aquina. These, these folks, we, we want that to be a robust delivery system. We want it to be culturally competent. We want people who are, who are distributing the food to have built really good, strong, trusting relationships with the people they're serving. That's why we use the community nurse to deliver soups and stews and, and frozen meals to the people that she's visiting in the community. If Rebecca Hegg just knocks on someone's door, who's a total, she's a total stranger and she says, hey, I'm here to give you food, they may or may not open the door for me, but they trust their doctor, they trust their social worker, they trust their church um, congregation member. Those are the people we want out there. The challenge we face as a community is where do we take all this bounty of food that we're trying to capture and store it and process it and get the right food to the right people at the right time? So a good example is that we go, as I mentioned before, we go off island every week to get eight to 9,000 pounds of food to distribute at the food pantry. That food is only going to last one week. We right now do not have a, a storage facility capable of having more than one week of food stored here. Now, how many of you have experienced the ferry isn't running, right? On any given day, there's a storm. You know, the ferries are out of commission. So we're dependent on a lifeline that has to happen every week. And that, life, uh, that lifeline is tenuous. So what we at IGI are trying to do is create a central island food, a, an island food center that gets capable of storing up to two to three to four weeks of food on the island. We need this for emergency purposes too. Noli's been reaching out to all the emergency managers in all the towns to say, what happens if, uh, if, if a hurricane hits or if there's a major storm or you know, the harbors are iced over? How are we going to feed our population? So it's not just those, you know, at that point, we may all need the food pantry and we wanna make sure that we have food available. So IGI is in the process of, um, it's, it's not public, you'll hear more about it, but we've identified a potential building 
that we can use as the permanent home of, of the food pantry or lease at uh, the PA club runs out um, at the beginning of next year. So we needed a permanent location. This Island Food Center will have the capacity to store, we'll have a warehouse, we'll have a shopping area, we'll have places where we can pack up food to, to deliver food and distribute it. And our long run vision is to have different distribution hubs nearer to the population that serve us. So if people don't have access to a bus line or they can't drive, we can make sure we get the food out to them. So you'll be hearing more about this, but you know, again, we, we don't wanna minimize the number of people distributing food, but we wanna serve as a source so that they know they can come to us, that if the person who's cooking for that community supper needs more meat or needs more vegetables, they come to the Island Food Center or they give us a call and we can make sure they have the food that they need if the schools are running short. So our vision is to create the infrastructure that we need to support the local providers of food and to be able to keep and save as much food as we can on island and also to have a resource just in case there is an emergency situation. So you'll be hearing much more about that, but that's really what's missing in our system so that all of our partners, an Island Grown Initiative um, basically helps oversee something called the um, Island Food uh, group. And that group is, it's called the Island Food Network. And it's about 30 to 35 agencies. And we meet on a regular basis, two or three times a year. And we talk about where are the gaps in the system. And what we hear over and over again is we need that infrastructure in place. So as one of the larger organizations, we've sort of taken it on as our mission to make sure that infrastructure is available for anyone out there um, in any organization that needs it. So um, the only final thing that I would say is that, that we really need to think about food as medicine. That if we want a healthy community, if we want a community that where people can thrive, where they're healthy and well, not only for the island, but for our system as a whole, we've got to make sure that people have access to the food they need. It's, it's always amazing to me when I hear these stories of people who are at risk for heart disease, at risk for diabetes, and we do nothing for them until they actually become diabetic so that, and then we give them medication. If we gave them good, healthy food, we could avoid people moving into the diabetes category. We could help avoid heart disease. Noli and I have met with Dr. Brown, the cardiology at, the cardiologist at the hospital. We're, look, we're working closely with the hospital and island healthcare to really begin to look at food as medicine, food as preventative medicine. The only way our healthcare system is going to survive, the only way we can afford to keep everybody in the system is that we begin to move from a disease management system to a health and wellness system. And food will be a critical part of that. So we're, we're looking to the future and looking to future funding is coming through the healthcare system Again, writing prescriptions for food as a way to prevent further disease. And so be on the lookout, more and more of that is gonna be happening. And again, the healthcare providers on the island are incredibly open to taking that approach and really wanna work with us to create more pilot programs. So we promised we'd try to end this in an, of talking heads in about half an hour and open it up to you for not just questions, but any comments that you have, uh, any, points you want to make, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be limited to Noli and I answering these. Some of you may have the answers as well. So Barbara, I'll hand it back to you to get people engaged. Thanks, Rebecca. And thanks, Noli, for all that great info. Um, as Rebecca said, we would like to open this up for conversation. Um, I see somebody already has their hand up, which is great. But if you do have a question, you can either use the Zoom raise hand feature, raise your actual hand, because we've got spotters look, keeping their eyes out for that or you can put questions in the chat uh, so feel free to do that and with that I will turn it to Mitzi if you could please unmute yourself before you ask your question hey you're all doing a great job and it's really exciting to think of this food center coming to fruition finally I hope that moves ahead easily um I was wanted to ask about Meg's comment in the chat about um, getting SNAP and HIP 
utilized at the farmer's market? What, what are the barriers to that? Meg, you should go ahead and talk. Uh, it's it's in the works. I've been advocating for it for a couple of years, and it seems like we've got um, the new market manager on board. There's a meeting tomorrow um, with the market committee that I'm invited to attend, which I'm planning to attend. So I think it's it's in the works. But the reality is that you know it's not that confusing of a program, but when you're first learning about it, it, it can be a little confusing for farmers that you know they're farmers, right? They're trying to grow right. as produce as possible. And so I think just the support of IGI and the um, greater group to to advocate for this and like signage and just any kind of facilitation with the pilot year. I also think just the West Bay Farmers Market is like the culmination of all the people, right? Where it's like the wealthiest people of, of Martha's Vineyard are coming to the farmers market. And the poorest people and the working people. So it's a real opportunity for exposure, um, you know, not only to get the food to the people, but to mm -hmm. show all the people that like, this is a program that exists. And I think it could be a really positive place for ripple effects, for more funding, for all the things that we want. Um, and just really quickly, the other thing I wanted to mention was, so it's in the works. I'm just like putting it out there to say, like, let's all you know, help with signage and promote it and encourage it, even though it will be a little fumbly. Um, at first, the main barrier, I think, is like access because it's at the information booth is where you would process. So like at Morning Glory, you process it right at the terminal, but at the farmer's market, it will be at like the where you buy the t-shirts spot, but for all the produce vendors. So that's just the piece that's confusing. Like you want to buy from uh, morning glory, but you have to like walk over and process it. So somebody that maybe isn't as able-bodied, um, that could be a barrier. So just having a sort of a golf cart plan and just just kind of brainstorming like how to make it the least complicated process, the most dignified process. But knowing that like you want to buy stuff at North Tabor, you have to go process it at the information booth. And just having like a understanding of how it works and knowing that people will be confused, but you just like walk them through it and you know, like I said to Noli, even if like five people use it this season, that's a success. The first year we had it at the store, it was pretty underutilized, but each year it builds more people come, people's caregivers come and use their card that aren't able to get out of the house. And it like normalizes it for not only them, but for people that don't need to be on a program. Um, but the other thing, I don't want to take up too much time, just the um, Fresh Connect. That's another program that I feel excited about that that's the prescription card, a totally separate program. We're um, able to take it at farmer's market, but so far nobody's used it. So I had had a call with them and um, offered that I could go to, like in the earlier season, go to Island Healthcare, like set up a farmer's market type booth and you know show people like, this is where you could buy it and then come do it at farmer's market. But I haven't heard back from them so that just like that's another program that we have on the island that people have the card but they don't know kind of how to work with it yet so it would be good to get some support there thank you meg meg is is an incredible mix of farmer and food equity advocate doing all the things <laughs> um, i could just say a couple more things about that um so first the fresh connect program is a really exciting step it's a um, it's a benefit program that is right now it's primarily funded through Mass Health, and it goes to healthcare providers. And the healthcare provider can basically prescribe um, it's a, a certain dollar value based on family size each month, and the and the patient would get a card that just looks like a, a debit card that they can use to get produce at local grocery stores, participating grocery stores. Um, and Meg has offered to have Morning Glory be one of the locations where that could be redeemed. And also um, our mobile market is another site where people could use those benefits, but it's just getting started. And it's this new kind of 
insurance funded mechanism to get more money into the food equity system, which is really important, especially for people who are facing diet related disease and food insecurity. So this is one of the pieces that we're looking forward to doing more of in the future years is working with our local healthcare providers at the hospital and at Island Healthcare to strengthen this focus on food as medicine and figure out how to make good food accessible to as many people as possible, especially the people who need it the most. Um, and then I just wanted to touch back on the farmer's market really quick. Um, our new field manager at our island grown farm, Ethan, is also the West Tisbury farmer's market manager this year. So that's a nice connection where we're able to work with Ethan and our food equity team, especially Sadie Dix, who's been running our mobile market, has experience accepting SNAP and HIP. So she's going to be working with Ethan. Um, she and her family also run North Tabor Farm, so they're going to be helping with maps and flow through the market for people who are there to, to utilize SNP, SNAP and HIP benefits. So it feels like our food equity network is really working well as a system that we have people with expertise from IGI who can help support these food equity um, initiatives in other places, including West Hisbury Farmers Market. Thanks, Mitzi, for your question and, for me and to Megan Noli for that super information. Um, Sarah Stiegelman, you have a question? Please unmute yourself. <clears throat> Excuse me. It's more of just letting everyone know that's on the call too, that there is um, a total of three food distribution places on the island. It's not just the island food pantry. So you also have the um, over at Good Shepherd Parish in Oak Bluffs. There's Food Baskets MV. And all that is open every Tuesday and the third, first and third Saturday of every month. Also, um, on the the third Thursday of the month, the Friday preceding the third, the fourth Thursday of every month is food is um, serving hands over in in over in Vineyard Haven at the First Baptist Church. Thanks, but I just know that there are you know, other food distributions yeah. so we can get that word out. Um, I run the one over in Oak, the other one over in Oak Bluffs at Food Baskets. And I have seen, um, since I've been there since October full time, there is a huge, I've noticed a huge increase of people coming in. Um, and I average about 10 clients every time that I'm open. Yeah, Sarah, thanks for that. With the, absolutely, we have we couldn't do all this work without all those the partners that are there. And Sarah's been a terrific collaborator. They also have a truck, so sometimes we can help each other with uh, picking up things off island. And and you've been terrific. And you know the uh, all the groups that are on the island, we not any one group can solve this problem. So we really appreciate the work that you do. Thank you. And then also just to go kind of go back on Meg's and the other comment with the SNAP, I personally find that talking with friends that are and people that come through the food pantry on that are on SNAP aren't even aware that they can even get the HIP benefit. They're very clueless. So I find that it's kind of a a DTA, it's coming from the Department Transition Transitional Authorities, that that's where it lacks yeah. for it to get out there. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, I think that's a great point. That's a huge challenge. And uh, just the education, just the dissemination of information, the county sign is really the source for signing people up for SNAP. And we've we've been trying to work with them. I know you have too, Sarah to try to get them to make sure that they're uh, sharing information with their clients. The good news is once we move the, um, the pantry and we have our new location, we will have uh, more space to be able to get people individual rooms so that people can come and sign up for SNAP benefits, have counselors and advisors from other organizations come in to work with people. But I think that's a great point, Sarah, that there are resources out there that people aren't always taking advantage of. And some of that is just knowing about it. And some might be cultural barriers that we need to work on to make sure people have that access. 
So thanks for your comments. That's great. And just so you guys know, I do talk to, I have friends and family off island that are on SNAP and they were even clueless yeah. of, of it. So it's not just an island based with the SNAP and the HIPAA or HIP. It's, it's across the, it's across the Massachusetts. Yeah. The great thing about this HIP program is that it started, just, just to give you guys a little background, it started as a federal pilot program of only four states were engaged. And I think the first year it was like $3 million in Massachusetts or something. And it, it, it's been, it actually has been highly successful, mostly because the farmers have really pushed it. The farmers, and particularly in other parts of the state, Western Mass and Central Mass, really used it as a way to increase the volume of business they had. And I think after the pilot program ended, Massachusetts picked it up. And I think that the, right now the HIP proposed budget for this year is something like $24 million. We're advocating right now at the state house to get that kind of money into the state budget. So I think it's the more, getting back to, to, to Meg's point, the more we can get the actual farmers uh, to engage in it and help educate their customers about it, that that would really be uh, helpful as well. Thanks, Sarah. Other Thank you, Sarah. or comments? Yeah. Any of you who are volunteers at the pantry have any in, any stories you want to tell? I see Nancy Weaver's on the call. She's like the gleaner extraordinaire for many, many years. There might be folks who have something. Lauren? I'm not actually one of the volunteers, but um, beyond, uh, in addition to volunteering at the food pantry or gleaning, are there any other ways that volunteers can get involved? Yeah, that's great. Let me talk a little bit about that. Um, so there's a whole bunch of ways to volunteer. As Sarah said, there are other programs out there that 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 might need help. But at Island Grown Initiative, um, first of all, we need we could not run the pantry without our volunteers. Volunteers literally sign up for weekly shifts. You know, there's the Tuesday afternoon group and the Thursday morning group, and they do everything from helping to unload the trucks of food to stocking the shelves, to actually helping people shop when they're there and talking to them. It, you know, actually, I, I, maybe somebody's on the call, but I, you know, I talk to volunteers who say, you know, I developed these relationships with the clients who come in so that, you know, Agnes comes in, you know, for the senior shopping and she always seeks me out and we always talk about what's available this week and what those recipes are. So people can actually have a lot of direct contact or they can actually pack up uh, bags of groceries for people who have ordered online. We have people who drive bags of groceries to people's homes. So there's a lot of different options there. Gleaning is great. If you like to be outside, if you like your, you know, to dig in the dirt, if you like to, you know, be in the open air, the gleaners uh, are a great group. And again, I think it's also a community thing. People, gleaners know each other and they help each other and they train the new people. We are also bring in, in the, in the fall, all, a lot of the school kids come in. I think we had I don't know, several hundred school age children gleaning this year. So that's another way that, that you can help. Uh, again, if you don't feel like you can dig in the fields, you can always be there to help you know, drive the food or, or just be there and collect the food that's coming out of the fields. We also need people in our kitchen. So if you like to cook, if you like, we need people who will chop vegetables and work with Jess um, to make the soups and stews and meals. And then, you know, the other thing is, that we can all we we all should think about in terms of our role as community members. You know, food is more than just nutrition. Food is love. Food is community. You know, food is family tradition. And um, you know, one thing you can all do is just reach out to your neighbors. You know, if you know the next door neighbor had to go to the emergency room and ended up with a broken leg, how can you help? Can you take meals? Can you go shopping for them? The elder woman who lives on, on your dirt road in the winter time. And, and it's not always just, you know, delivering the food. Maybe you take lunch and sit with somebody and share food. Um, that's the way we build community. We can all, we can all do that. Um, and it's so, it's surprising to me every day, the stories that you just hear. And, and as families gets disrupted from a child, 
having an illness and having to go off island, you know, to take care of that child. It, it, people are here live very close to the edge with many obstacles and being good neighbors and using food as the connector can be one of the most valuable things any of us can do. Thanks, Rebecca. Thanks, Lauren, for your question. Are there any other questions? Meg, you have your hand up again. Meg, if you can unmute yourself. I just, yeah, just, I couldn't figure it out for a second. Um, so I just wanted to ask, um, did anybody use at the mobile market the Fresh Connect? No, the Fresh Connect is still just being rolled out. Yeah. With healthcare, and I think there's they're working out their communication with their people. So we need to work more on that. Yeah, that's something maybe we can connect with after because I think there's like 30 something people have cards on the island but I just feel excited because my terminal is ready to take it and I'm willing to kind of help people you know understand it but uh, it, it'd be nice again like with that opportunity with the hip snap at the market if we could also get fresh connect there it just shows you know shows people what's out there do it I think this is something let's definitely make this a priority Noli, because I think this this issue has, keeps coming up is that, you know, not only how, how do we serve people directly or the uh, or Sarah or the others engaged in the delivery system, but how do we really connect them to the resources that are available to them? And, you know, we're lucky to live in a state like Massachusetts. There are many programs out there. So I think this is a good lesson, Meg, that we just need to all work together to improve our communication with people, make sure that we're connecting them to the programs. And sometimes that's more than just a flyer. You know, I think we're gonna to have to be more proactive with, with those that come into our doors and really help walk them through the process. So we'll make, we'll make that a priority for the coming year. Sounds good. Great. Anyone else comments or questions? Well, I just wanna thank everybody for making the time to be with us today. We really appreciate your participation. Thanks again to Rebecca and Noli for all the great information and to all of you for the great discussion. The session is recorded, so you'll be getting a link to that and hopefully you will share it with uh, friends, family, and other community members to help them understand what's going on on the island in terms of food insecurity and what we're doing to help mitigate that. I want to thank you once more and wish you all a happy Wednesday. Take care. Thank you very much. Thanks, thank everyone. You, everyone.